So far in our little series, we've explored the Appalachian roots of country music through the story of Charlie Poole, the Western influences as well as its convergence with the blues through the father of country music, Jimmy Rogers. We've run down the twin paths of the sincere singers, the king of country music, Roy Acuff, and the godfather of honky-tonk, Ernest Tubb, and on to their perfect distillation as Hank Williams pointed the music out of the regional ghetto. This week we're going to look at a dozen artists who were there alongside Poole and Rogers and from whom Acuff and Tubb emerged. The great and often forgotten country acts from 1924 to 1946. So relax and enjoy. Let's begin at the beginning with Ezekiel Eck Robertson, a man some folks claim to be the first white rural act to be recorded when he made a series of recordings for RCA from 1922 to 1929. Eck was an old-time fiddler from Texas, where they take old-time fiddling mighty seriously, and he and his friend Henry C. Gilliand won enough prizes at fairs to travel to New York City in June 1922, where they, both as a duet and Eck solo, cut their first records, Sally Gooden, backed with Arkansas Traveller. The record wasn't widely distributed until Fiddlin' John Carson cut some moderately well-selling sides for OK in 1924, at which point the existing sides from Eck, plus some new recordings made in Dallas in 1929, were reissued and issued. The story goes that Eck recorded over a hundred songs in 1940, but no studio listing or actual recording has ever surfaced. Eck was still a popular local attraction around Dallas until the late 1960s, and he passed away at the good old age of 88 in 1975. Marion Slaughter was the first million-selling hillbilly artist, even though he took a peculiar route to get there. His stage name, Vernon Dalhart, was taken from the two Texas towns where he worked in his teens punching cattle. It was singing that got him out of poking cows, however. Wanting to be an opera singer, he attended the Dallas Conservatory of Music and packed up his family in 1910 to move to New York. He made his operatic debut in Madame Butterfly in 1913 and started as a recording artist in 1916. He recorded many, many sides under many different aliases for many different companies, but it wasn't until his release in November 1924 of the old-timey tune The Wreck of the Old 97 that he and his career found lasting fame. The tune of Wreck of the Old 97 dates back to 1865, and the lyrics of much disputed authorship since shortly after the wreck in 1903. The song was the first million seller in country music history, and it's said that until White Christmas came along, it was the biggest selling record ever. Gideon Gid Tanner was as red dirt as the Georgia clay that bore his chicken ranch near Dakula, Georgia. A champion fiddler, he and his band the Skillet Lickers were interesting in so much that in the course of a relatively lengthy career, they experimented with the traditional Appalachian song form in terms of structure and instrumentation. One mainstay of the band was Riley Puckett, the first guitar hero of country music. Tanner was still a good seller for Columbia when he lay his fiddle down in 1939 to concentrate on his chicken ranch, and he passed away in Dacula at the age of 75 in 1960. Tennessee's Uncle Dave Macon, known as the Dixie Dewdrop, was a force of nature and easily one of the most recognisable stars of the early country scene. With his voluminous whiskers, half-top hat and gates ajar collar and his boisterous banjo and booming voice, Uncle Dave got his start in vaudeville where he developed a polished stage show while maintaining and projecting all his hillbilly rough edge and perfecting his snappy comedy and biting satirical routines. This made him a natural for the burgeoning Grand Ole Opry and he was the biggest star there for the first 15 years of it. All up he spent 26 years on the Opry, only his death in 1952 finally signing him off. Georgia boy Riley Puckett was far more than Gid Tanner's guitarist. He was a relentless experimenter who obviously understood jazz and incorporated it into his playing. Blind since infancy, Puckett was a prolific maker of records for Decca but mainly Columbia and its subsidiaries. Great as he was a guitarist, but was also a very popular vocalist, and this was seen best on his take on the great country standard Ragged Blit Wright, later a huge hit for old George Jones. Riley died of blood poisoning in 1946 through leaving a boil on his neck unattended too long before having it lanced. So country music's greatest guitarist handed on the baton to the boys in Bob Wills and Ernest Tubbs bands, who were just starting to get hot and electric. 
Gene Autry may not seem a natural inclusion for this list, being seen by many as a movie cowboy more famous for Christmas songs, but his clean living, tough and resourceful persona encapsulated a lot of what America once saw in itself, and his performances of country music in innumerable B-features and occasionally the big leagues saw him reach a level of influence almost on a par with that of Jimmy Rogers. Born in Texas and raised in Oklahoma, Autry was a recording star before he went to films. His early records were far more hillbilly than his commercial movie sides, but were excellent records nonetheless. His first big hit was in 1932 with that silver-haired daddy of mine, which, and he went on to sell his estimated 100 million records in his career. He authored over 300 songs as well. Autry was also the idol of a young Hank Williams, who despite a general absence of cowboys around Montgomery, Alabama, insisted still in dressing as one in tribute to his idol. The Carter Family In June and early August 1927, legendary talent scout and a and man Ralph Peer recently disposed of by OK Records, held auditions and recording sessions on the third floor of the Taylor Christian Hat and Glove Company on State Street, Bristol, Tennessee. This is the state line between Tennessee and Virginia, so had the sessions been held on the other side of the road, Virginia could have claimed to be the birthplace of country music, not Tennessee. In all, 19 acts were recorded and 76 songs were captured. The selection was dazzling. The traditional ballads of Ernest Stoneman, the fiery gospel sides of blind Alfred Reed, who later cut How Can a Poor Man Stand Such Times and Live, recorded by noted lunkhead Bruce Springsteen, the sermonizing of Alfred Carnes, the country wheels of the West Virginia Coon Hunters, the father of country music himself, Jimmy Rogers, and the one and only African-American act, the great harmonica player, L. Watson. Johnny Cash later called the sessions the Big Bang of country music. But from the moment Sarah Carter opened her mouth to sing, Pierre knew he'd found his superstars. By the end of 1930, they'd sold about 300,000 records. The usual lineup was Sarah, who sang and played either auto harp or guitar, AP, who rarely sang leads but harmonized with Sarah and her cousin Maybelle, whose Carter scratch guitar style is the basis of most modern folk and country playing. In the 1930s, the Carter's influence expanded as AP became a collector of old folk songs, which he rewrote just enough to publish under his own name, increasing his and Sarah's income from the band immensely. Mark one of the Carters persisted until 1936, after AP discovered Sarah had been slipping around with his cousin Coy. AP and Sarah divorced in 1939 and AP died in 1960. The Carters reformed in the late 40s with Sarah and Maybelle, joined by Maybelle's daughters Helen, Anita and June, who went on to marry Johnny Cash. They continued until 1958 before dissolving. Maybelle and Sarah did get back together in the mid-60s to play folk festivals, but died within three months of each other between October 1978 and January 1979. They left a huge legacy for both the way country music is played, how it's perceived by the wider industry, and in songs that are the bedrock of the genre. Few cast a longer shadow than the mighty Carters. Alabama boys Raybon and Alton Delmore are considered the godfathers of rockabilly due to their intricate guitar interplay, boisterous songs and boogie-woogie beats. There was, of course, another side to the boys as they were also highly reputed gospel singers, but the real money and influence lay in their boogies. After leaving the Grand Ole Opry in 1938, where they'd been big stars, they went on the radio in North Carolina, but it looked like it was all over for them. In 1942, they signed for King Records and started to make their truly influential records. Unlike a lot of King acts, King came to record the brothers in situ, rather than have them check into King in Cincinnati. The boys were big stars again. They added a third brother, Wayne Rainey, who played harmonica and made some great sides with them, including their big hit Freight Train Blues and their signature tune, Blues Stay Away From Me. Tragedy struck, however, when Raybon died, aged only 36, of lung cancer. Alton then lost his sister, his father, and had a heart attack over the next three years. He withdrew from music and became a writer of short stories. He passed away in 1964. His autobiography, published posthumously in 1977, was called Truth is Stranger Than Publicity and is a witty and unflinching first-hand look at the struggles of the early professional country musicians and a trove of stories of cattiness, kindness and community behind the early days of the Grand Old Opry. Mel Travis, 
the hillbilly Hendrix and pride of Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, was not just the greatest guitarist of his age, he might just be the most influential country guitarist of all time. Not only was Merle responsible for inventing or popularising new techniques that are still the bedrock of country guitar playing, his unique three-finger picking style, which when adapted to banjo, ended the claw hammer and frailing techniques, which had dominated banjo since before the Civil War, and he also popularised string skipping, which is not only a country staple, but gets used a lot in metal as well. He was also one of the leading designers on the legendary Bigsby Travis guitar, a 1947 solid-bodied electric guitar that predates the Les Paul by five years, the Telecaster by three years, and the Gretsch 6120 by eight. He was also a pioneer in overdubbing, as 1947's Merle Boogie Woogie will attest. A true polymath, he was also a watchmaker, a taxidermist, an actor, an important songwriter, a cartoonist, and a railway engineer. Travis was notoriously difficult to work with, his drinking didn't help, but he had a big run of vocal hits from 1945 to 48. This came in spite of the fact that when he signed for Capitol, he signed a contract that forbid him from playing guitar on his own records. They got around that part of it by playing on all of his friends' records, including his good buddies the Delmore Brothers, regardless of what label they were on. A lifelong sufferer of crippling stage fright, although apparently once he got out there he was a spellbinding and confident performer. Later in his career, he mellowed a lot and began making records with the likes of Joe Mathis and Chet Atkins until his death in 1983. Father of bluegrass, along with his brothers Birch and Charlie, was another Kentuckian, Bill Munro. Munro had a career of almost 70 years as a recording artist, in concert attraction, band leader, and general moral authority on the purity of bluegrass. Beginning in 1936, after Birch had left the group, the Munro brothers began to have hits in the traditional string band style, alternating sincere and sweetly sung gospel tunes with some rowdy hoedowns. He was invited to the Grand Ole Opry in 1939, where he remained for 58 years. Years. Up until the end of World War II, Munro continually experimented with his lineup and his sound, in particular with his vocal harmonies. In 1945, he hired Earl Scruggs, whose galloping rhythm playing and intricate bass turnarounds defined the genre's guitar playing, and Lester Flatt, who had adapted Merle Travis's guitar picking style and rewritten the rule book for banjo overnight, turning it from a solid part of the rhythm section to a vision of maniacal, dazzling fantasias. Added to the band, he had his own virtuoso mandolin style, plus two excellent fiddlers in Chubby Wise and the revered Howdy Forrester. This lineup cut a lot of Munro's biggest hits, including his self-penned Blue Moon of Kentucky. In 1949, Flatt and Scruggs left to start the Foggy Mountain Boys, and Munro recorded Rudy Lyle on banjo and the legendary and extremely volatile Jimmy Martin on guitar and vocals. Martin was a brilliant guitarist and a peerless singer whose harmony with Munro created Bluegrass's patent high lonesome sound. The next five years were a second golden age for Munro which ended with a car wreck in 1954. After that with his layoff and changes in musical tastes, there were many lean years for Munro until the folk festival revivals made him a top drawer again. He died in 1996 having had to retire from touring only in April that year after a stroke. Hero of Jerry Lee Lewis, Hank Williams' favourite singer, possible co-author of rock and roll, Texas piano pounder Moon Mullican brought a hard-to-define style to the nascent honky-tonk scene, which mixed blues, western swing, a bit of jazz and some straight-ahead boogie-woogie into a rollicking good time. Or as Mullican himself once said, music that'll make the beer bottles bounce off the tables. Born in Polk County in the east of Texas, as if his music didn't give you a clue to that, Mulliken began playing the organ in church, but soon started befriending black sharecroppers who taught him the country blues. By 1936, he was recording and playing in traveling bands, his style very directly influenced by Jimmy Rogers and Bob Wills. From 1942 to 45, he was one of the top session piano players before founding his own band, The Showboys, and signing with King Records enjoying a rambunctious run of hits from the late 40s to the mid 50s. Despite being at the epicenter of all of the forces creating rock and roll, Moon stayed working more in the honky-tonk vein until he signed for Coral Records in 1958. Coral, 
more of a rock and roll oriented offshoot of Decca. It was Buddy Holly's label. His rock and roll sides flopped and super producer Owen Bradley tried to record him in the Nashville sound, but that didn't work. Moon in his heart was just a rowdy old royster doister, playing rowdy songs for rowdy people in rowdy little roadside bars. His real contribution was co-writing Jambalaya with Hank Williams and showing a generation of Memphis-bound country boys how to kick up their heels. Moon was still working and recording when death felled him in 1967. Bob Wills Merle Haggard once said, I can't really say why everyone loved Bob Wills' music but I've yet to meet a person who didn't like it. And I have to say I feel the same way. Wills' music is a music of joy, of heart, of people being together and slapping their feet on a dance floor somewhere. It's carefree, not careless, and it reflected Wills' personality as larger than life, gregarious and generous of nature. Born in the town of Cossey, Texas, down Waco Way, Wills learned blues songs from the sharecroppers who picked cotton on his family's farm. His father was a former Texas state champion fiddler, and he passed his proclivity on to Bob. Inspired to become a musician himself after he saw Bessie Smith perform in 1925, he formed his first dance band in 1929 and got onto the radio with the Light Crust Doughboys in 1930. In 1932, the Doughboys leader, Milton Brown, formed his own group and started to play the music which would later be known as Western Swing. Wills later married and divorced Brown's widow twice, within six months. Wills formed his own group, the Texas Playboys, and eventually relocated to Tulsa in 1934, and from 1935 commenced issuing one of the greatest catalogues in all American popular music, becoming the biggest grossing act in the land in 1944, and at one point sporting a 23-piece band. But it all fell apart so quickly for Wills. His managers, you see, didn't bother to pay his taxes for many years, and Bob had to sell everything. His drinking got worse, although he later sobered up, which meant he began to miss gigs. This meant that his huge band only got paid scale instead of a share of the much larger fee they'd have got if the headliner had appeared. Eventually, he lost not only his band, but the services of his best friend, allied, and one of America's greatest ever vocalists in Tommy Duncan. Two heart attacks in 1962 felled a budding comeback, but a 1969 stroke signaled the beginning of the end. In December 1973, at a reunion session with the Playboys, Wills, who'd been in sprightly form on the first day of the sessions, suffered a final debilitating stroke in his sleep that night. He lingered for another 15 months until he died of pneumonia in Fort Worth in May 1975. By the end of World War II, country music was trifurcating. Between the purest stylings of bluegrass, the Texas blues and Cajun beat of rockabilly, and the openly emotional and electric music of Honky Tonk. Bluegrass saw the emergence of its second wave of superstars, Flatten Scruggs, Jimmy Martin and the Dillards. Rockabilly saw acts like Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins and Elvis Presley emerge and evolve into one tranche of the original rock and roll stars. Honky Tonk went on to dominate country for another dozen years built on its great stars Hank Thompson, Ernest Tubb, Ray Price, Lefty Frizzell and old Hank Williams. But that's another story for another day.